Okay, so maybe Sarah, we should just start. Yes, let's start then. Um, hello and welcome to our community of practice event on blockchain for climate action today. Um, it's great that already a few people joined our call. Um, and I think we have to start as uh, we're lucky that Pierre made it today, but he can only stay shortly. So um, we have to hurry with the beginning a bit. Um, this event is part of a series that we as blockchain partnerships are organizing. And uh, blockchain partnerships is part of the project Digital Transformation, which is funded by the German Federal Ministry of um, Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, to support partner countries in their digital transformation. And um, my colleagues, Sören and Sebastian, maybe Sebastian, you can also turn on your camera so that uh, we can all see you. We are specifically working on blockchain. And maybe just a very quick note before we start with the event. Um, this event will be recorded or my colleague Sebastian already started the recording. So by staying in the call, you agree with being recorded. If that is not OK with you, um, I unfortunately have to ask you to leave the call and we will provide the recording of the event afterwards with you. Um, but that's just yeah to to make sure everyone who's in the call is okay with that. And yeah, so coming back to blockchain um, in the news and in the minds of many people, blockchain is mainly connected with Bitcoin and with huge consumptions of energy. But blockchain is more than cryptocurrencies. And that is what we set out to explore in this community of practice series. So what we have want to have a look at is how can we use blockchain and its very specific character characteristics to support sustainable development. So this community of practice aims to bring together practitioners from within, but also from outside of GIZ to exchange knowledge and share best practices, how blockchain can support sustainable development. And um, today's, um, today's topic is climate action. This is the second event in the series. And um, I forgot to share my screen, but I'm going to do that now quickly because we have amazing uh, speakers for today who have been working. I think you can see them on, this, on the slide now who have been working on blockchain and distributed ledger technology and climate action extensively. We have a very small change in the agenda, though. So Matthew Jarga is not going to be able to join us today. He just called this morning uh, that he became father yesterday. So obviously he now is with his family and we will instead have Zuren uh, from Blockchain Partnerships jumping in to present our project a bit and um, our considerations in the realm of uh, climate action. Sören will also be moderating the discussion, so we'll have uh, inputs from our speakers in the beginning and then enough of time in, in the end for an open discussion and Q&A. So feel free to post any questions you might have in the chat anytime and my colleague Sebastian and me will gather these for the discussion in the end. And with that, I guess I'll hand over to Sören to start our discussion. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, welcome again, Sarah, and uh, welcome to everyone. So I think with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Pierre, Pierre Marot, a real expert from the European Commission on blockchain and digital innovation. So Pierre, please, um, uh, the word is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Many thanks, uh, Zoren. I'm, I'm going to give you a presentation where I will uh, introduce the different uh, action that we are implemented for blockchain at uh, at the EC level. It's not exhaustive, but it's uh, it's uh, already reflect uh, important uh, action that we have launched, in particular in uh, in uh, in my unit. Uh, uh, can you see my uh, uh, my slide? Yes. Okay, and then at the end, uh, towards the end of this presentation, I will uh, develop a little bit uh, 
how uh, the blockchain and the climate change activities can be related and I think it will uh, open the, the opportunity for the other uh, speakers and participants to uh, give their uh, views on, uh, on it. Huh? So just uh, to um, in a nutshell what uh, what we have done uh, as part of the of main action that we that we are implemented uh, in uh, at urban commission level is that uh, we want first to uh, advance with uh, the other member states uh, with all representative uh, with representative of all the member states uh, through what we call the urban blockchain partnership on uh, important uh, activities that we can uh, make jointly uh, in order to make the best of this technology and one specific uh, action that we have launched is what we call the open blockchain service infrastructure uh, this fc uh, which is uh, one activities around which we can federate uh, uh, various uh, various initiatives that can help for uh, best use of blockchain for different policy purposes one of them being for uh, action in relation to the green agenda or uh, climate change uh, purpose. Huh? So another important work stream for the Commission is to provide for more legal certainty for people to be able to use or to innovate with uh, with blockchain or DLTs. Uh, finally, um, we, uh, not finally, but uh, we also support a lot of uh, research and innovation projects. I'm, I'm sure that many of the, the speakers have been associated to one of these projects in a, Delivered, uh, I found implemented at the open level uh, already in the past. We act also in order to uh, um, support skill development, but also to uh, have, a, uh, let's say, a debate or between uh, experts, between practitioners, and between different stakeholders on what uh, could be uh, done with blockchain. This is something that we have done through the European Obser Blockchain Observatory and Forum. And uh, we also we are also engaged with different partners uh, about the global cooperation and in particular for interoperability and standardization. So we have, dif we have different support action concerning uh, standardization, but we are also liaising uh, very uh, often with uh, the International Association for Blockchain uh, Application in ADBA. Mariana is uh, is uh, an active uh, actor in uh, in, uh, in in ADBA. So that's uh, Okay, in a nutshell, the type of uh, activities that we have launched over the recent period that we continue to implement and to support at your level. So uh, I'm not going to enter to all of them with uh, with detail, but uh, with a blockchain partnership, what is uh, what is great is that uh, we have a cooperation initiated with all the member states plus Norway, plus Liechtenstein, Ukraine is now an observer, and we have a. Uh, other countries that um, would like to uh, to join this partnership and it gives us yeah. a platform. S yes. Sorry to interrupt. Could you um, switch to full screen so that we can see the your full presentation? Oh, you cannot see it. Um, we I think we still see the presenter mode and it's also rather small. Sorry to, for interrupting you. Yes, I'm surprised for it because it seems to. Uh... It's not in presenting mode. Um, doesn't look like it now. Right, let me uh, let me change. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, okay. Is it's it bottom bottom right? In, in which uh, in the PowerPoints uh, setup on the very bottom of your of your big slide. Yes, and then you go to the one next to the zoom. Because for me, it seems to to work uh, to work very well. Well, okay. Is it better now? No. Now I have the same issue, Pierre, but like then if you make it bigger as you were doing before, it is easy for us to, to read. OK, I'm. Uh, um, some... No, just just the page itself. So if you go to the corner, the right corner and and then just like try to make your exactly. OK, yeah, I, I don't know what better. is. Uh... Yeah, I don't know what is happening because for me it seems to be OK, but OK, so you can follow it. Yeah. Now. Better? Yes, please go ahead. Yes. 
Okay, sorry for that. Uh, so this partnership, as I said, was uh, is a, a very important vehicle for us in order to uh, develop a joint cooperation on blockchain, in particular through this uh, infrastructure. But uh, there is no real limitation about uh, what could be done with this partnership, and uh, through this uh, EPSI infrastructure, we can federate also other initiatives. Huh? So uh, that's. Uh, what we aim to uh, to uh, to address, uh, I mean, that's another slide which explains what we are doing now. What is very important is that the focus of this uh, infrastructure is now on public uh, services, cross-border public services. However, uh, it's not only uh, for administration, it's more about uh, which type of uh, interaction we can uh, build now with new technology, with DLT, with Web 3.0 technology for the administration to exchange uh, information uh, with uh, individuals but also with enterprise with organization for different purposes in particular for the implementation for the implementation of of, uh, of policies so along uh, along this uh, blockchain uh, infrastructure initiative uh, with also the support of the blockchain partnership we have we are also launching now what we call the open blockchain regulatory sandbox which is a, a new initiative where uh, they will will select uh, in cohort uh, different projects or startup that for which we could establish a specific dialogue between uh, the project promoters and uh, the regulators uh, of different uh, uh, countries if they plan to operate in different countries. And with that, we expect also to uh, consolidate a, a list of good and best practices that can help for the for the innovators to uh, to go for more legal certainty. So since I've lost some time, I'm not going to be uh, too uh, too much into the detail. But what I want to to, to stress is that in the context of the EPSI infrastructure, we are quite advanced for uh, the implementation of verifiable credential, in particular uh, for education credential. But the models that we have developed can be used for different fields. And um, and now we want also to uh, accelerate very much on the traceability uh, type of use case, which are really relevant in the context of uh, climate change actions in, part uh, in particular for the, the purpose of circular economy. For what concerns uh, the uh, is, um, legal certainty, uh, over the recent period we have worked uh, in co cooperation with other services of the Commission with different regulations. One of them which is very important is about uh, Mika, uh, it's called Mika, it's a crypto asset uh, regulation. I think that uh, you you are aware about what has happened over the recent period uh, justifies that there is a regulation which is implemented. It, uh, Mika will be adopted very soon, but I will come back to the fact that uh, there are specific uh, items which concern uh, climate change action, which are also addressed uh, via Mika. Uh, another uh, regulation, which is uh, which is a debate uh, at uh, between the uh, Council and Parliament, uh, following a proposal of the Commission, concern uh, the, the new EIDAS, uh, European Digital Identity Regulation. And here also we have, uh, if, even if we have no reference to uh, blockchain or DLTs, but there is a reference to uh, electronic ledger as a new trust services, and those uh, electronic ledger could be implemented on uh, based on uh, on on DLTs and. Uh, that will be a way to recognize uh, the role of DLTs uh, for this purpose. Data Act, which uh, include uh, some article concerning uh, smart contract and the regulatory sandbox that I have uh, that I have explained uh, that I have introduced already. Yeah? So for this uh, for this uh, sandbox, um, as I said, we will uh, we will um, how to say um, select uh, different uh, startup or project uh, in cohort we we plan over the next two years to have uh, three cohort of uh, at least 20 projects and that will uh, for which we will uh, there will be a facilitator that will uh, uh, enable or uh, make the dialogue easier between the project promoters and uh, and the regulators and also to consolidate the experience that will be gained through this initiative about uh, research innovation project, we, uh, as I say, we have supported uh, nearly uh, for uh, 350 million euros over the last five years, mainly through the program Horizon 2020, but it will continue in the new program Horizon Europe. Uh, so we address uh, different type of uh, of uh, sectors or uh, activities 
uh, including uh, sustainability. So we, we have uh, here you see in, in yellow uh, uh, that a significant part of the project uh, relating to uh, blockchain are in this uh, in this field. So with the uh, European Sandbox, uh, sorry, um, Observatory and Forum, um, this is a, a think tank or, uh, which uh, helps to uh, regroup different uh, experts, uh, practitioners uh, around different topics that we address and se several uh, reports that have been published over the recent period are linked uh, to the use uh, of uh, blockchain uh, in the energy sector or um, or about the, the energy consumption of uh, of blockchain and this uh, can contribute to the to the dialogue for uh, climate change related uh, action we have specific projects for skills development we are also now we have launched a call for exp proposal uh, which aims to uh, helps university to develop new program for key uh, technology uh, including blockchain not only on the blockchain but for uh, including blockchain so that's an important program and we are uh, also through the chase project supporting cooperation to establish new uh, uh, plan for skills development uh, to be implemented at a national level uh, in adba uh, and standardization i can be quick uh, on them uh, so INADBA is a very important uh, association for us. It's, uh, it's, uh, we have helped to this uh, association to be created. It's an international association. So the main objective of uh, INADBA is uh, to help for uh, interoperability, for governance of uh, different uh, blockchain that could act globally. And as part of the work of INADBA, and probably Mariana will come back to it, we have a specific, uh, there are specific works which concern uh, uh, climate change or uh, blockchain for sustainability and uh, different action for uh, standardization here uh, maybe uh, for you to know we have uh, selected uh, two new projects that will help to reinforce the participation of European ex experts in a very uh, proactive way in different working groups or activities implemented by international standardization uh, bodies so uh, um, for those who are interested in standardization, uh, those projects could help them to to participate in the in, in those work. Now I would like to uh, to conclude my my presentation about uh, the the topic of today. Uh, as part of the different actions that we do, there are several of them uh, concern uh, concern climate change, and we could see it as a kind of cross cutting element in the in the different actions that we support. So. And we can consider two types of, uh, of uh, action. One is uh, the sustainability of the blockchain itself. When I say blockchain, I mean uh, every kind of DLTs. And it's not, uh, we use the terms uh, blockchain in a bit uh, inappropriate way, but it's, uh, we should say uh, DLTs. Um, so as part of the MICA regulation, there is a, a requirement for transparency for what concerns the energy consumption or, or, uh, or the impact on, uh, on climate for uh, what concerns the crypto uh, asset. So that's uh, an important element and uh, there will be a need uh, for the Commission to elaborate a report after two years of the Im implementation of the start of the implementation of the MICA. So already a focus on uh, on uh, sustainability aspect as part of the, of the MICA. We have also uh, um, in October this year uh, the Digital Energy Action Plan which have been uh, uh, published and which, uh, which include uh, a reference to the use of uh, of peer-to-peer -peer solution in order to um, facilitate the implementation of uh, concerning the energy consumption at local uh, level and the different local energy initiative or building energy communities. So blockchain is not uh, explicitly mentioned here, but it could be one of the solutions that will help for the specific objective of the action plan. But the action plan also insists on the need uh, to uh, assess uh, the environmental and climate impact of a new technology and in particular for what concern uh, the crypto asset or the blockchain. So here also there is a reference to specific reports that should be made and there will be of course synergy with the report that should be made also for, uh, for Mika. But we we, uh, we have also uh, as part of the FC aiming to um, uh, to uh, so we are calling at the same time uh, to uh, to implement uh, EPSI in a way which is uh, eco-friendly. So uh, for the time being, the choice of the consensus mechanism, which is based on proof of authority, make it uh, make it uh, easy. Uh, the EPSI initiative eco-friendly. 
and we are working through the PCP and the IOTA uh, is uh, uh, one of the three projects which is selected for the last phase of the PCP on future evolution of the solution for the EPSI that could be even more uh, less energy consuming. Uh, the, the ecosystem itself is uh, is evolving and uh, the, the, the the big uh, the big case is uh, the, the successful uh, evolution of Ethereum through the merge, which is a good signal given by the, uh, the blockchain community. And uh, to address this uh, aspect of uh, of sustainability for blockchain, as I said, we have uh, we have different reports that can be elaborated in particular as part of the blockchain of Sartorin Forum. Last slide uh, for me, which concerns the other approach, is the use of blockchain for sustainability. So. As I said before, for the digital energy action plan, there is this element which is here. There is also an important uh, proposal for uh, EU regulation which concerns uh, eco design for sustainable products, which make reference to the digital product passport, which is an important element uh, where blockchain could help to be uh, to implement uh, the digital passport products. So this is. Uh, also a topic that we, uh, we, we we take into account in our activities, which concern uh, EPSI and the future evolution of EPSI through the PCP. Uh, there are different uh, initiatives which are launched uh, around the digital passport product, and it's probably something that you are going to, uh, to develop. There are works which are more advanced concerning uh, the batteries, the traceability of battery for circular economic purpose. And uh, I know that there is an initiative in Germany, at least one in Germany, which uh, which consider uh, blockchain as a, as part of the solution. And here also we we can continue to animate the debate as things evolve uh, with the observatory, uh, with our think tank, the observatory uh, blockchain um, uh, and, and forum. Uh, as part of the EPSI project, we could also consider not only to support the implementation of the digital passport product, but other system which could concern, for instance, uh, carbon trading system uh, or uh, or even support to a local energy community. Uh, that's something that we could envisage in, in future step. Doesn't mean that everything will have to be done on EPSI, but EPSI could play a role uh, in connection with other solutions for implementing those uh, those solutions in, uh, which uh, will provide a better image of blockchain uh, for sustainability than the one that exists today, which was reminded by uh, Sarah at the beginning of, uh, of this uh, event. That's the end of my presentation. Sorry for uh, having, uh, having been a bit long and uh, for the, the poor uh, sharing of the slide. And then fortunately, I, I have to, to leave you uh, very soon now, but I don't know if you have one question or one remark. I can't stay for, for that one. Well, thank you so much, Pierre. Please don't worry. <laughs> so uh, if there are any questions, please, on the European Commission's blockchain strategy, please, now is uh, your moment. <laughs> if anybody would like to ask a question. Yes, oh, David. David Jensen, please, from UNIP. Hi, Pierre. Yeah, thank you very much. You talked a little bit about uh, digital product passports. I, I think this is one of those fundamental investments in enabling a circular economy. So I'm just curious if you could expand that a little bit more um, in terms of, you know, the, the the idea of underpinning DPPs with blockchain and and what the what the current state of affairs currently is. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, for, for the time being, uh, all the regulation at the EU level make reference to the digital product passport, but not to the blockchain. But blockchain could be one of the solutions uh, that that uh, that can be uh, considered uh, for, uh, for implementing it. And uh, as part of the different initiatives that we have at, uh, at the European level, in particular for what concerns this European blockchain service infrastructure, we work on it. Huh? So. And uh, for, uh, for instance, just for this European blockchain service infrastructure, we are going to think about uh, the current solution that we have, but we have also what we call the PCP uh, in the slide that I've shown, which is mean uh, pre-commercial procurement. We are working with uh, solution providers, one of them being uh, IOTA, which is uh, invited to the, to the discussion of today, in order to provide even better solution, uh, related to a blockchain or to a distributed ledger technology. I mean, the, the one of IOTA is not purely blockchain, but but a DLT uh, in order, yes, to uh, yes to, to, to provide for it. So there, there, I would say, I would like to say that there is two main strands. One is uh, to define what is a digital product passport, which is not something that uh, 
we manage directly in my in my unit, but we have different initiatives, in particular the CIRPAS uh, project, uh, which is in one of my slides. Uh, and by the way, I have sent the, the slide to uh, to Sarah and uh, Zoren, so they, they, they can be shared afterwards. Uh, which is uh, to, okay to define what is this uh, this um, uh, digital passport product, but also it's good that we start. Uh, we we do not wait for the end of this work in order to start to think about uh, what could be the best solution in order to implement it. And here we see a role for blockchain, but of course there are uh, many other uh, technologies that could uh, that could provide for it. Huh? So there is no let's say, um, prerequisite or requirement, uh, explicit requirement for the Commission to implement uh, digital passport products through blockchain. But uh, as part of the initiative where I'm involved, in particular the, the EPC project, we would like to do that. And, uh, and we expect that uh, also in your, uh, in your event you can debate about it and uh, we are glad to see that there are already uh, initiatives in Germany, in particular in the field of battery, which, uh, which concerns the implementation of digital passport product uh, based on blockchain. Thank you so much. Just very quickly to Nick Belling, Beglinger from Clean Tech. Yes, Sorry. thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Pierre, for this. Uh, I'm also quite interested in the uh, digital product passport. Um, I'm glad the question was raised. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that maybe this could also be relevant with respect to CBAM, to the carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, where you, it's so not just the circular economy uh, focus, but also the carbon embodied in products uh, so that um, at the border an adjustment can take place. We are, we have a project that works on this very issue. So just to draw the, your attention to that. And then my question would be on digital identification for, for people. Uh, so, um, you know, the ultimate state may be a, a DLT based self-sovereign identity but i'd like to know how how far is the eu on on the digital identification of of people thanks yes uh, thanks to for your question so first you're right i mean the digital passport product is not only for circular but it is uh, for uh, uh, helping to reduce energy consumption and also to remove uh, and to reduce sorry, the, the carbon food, footprint and so it's not only about uh, then about um, digital identity, uh, there are different uh, initiatives. The main one, which is subject to a proposal of a regulation, is the one which concerns the evolution of EIDAS, uh, which calls a regulation for a new uh, EU uh, digital identity. In this context, there is currently an ongoing work to define what could be a new, a new wallet for digital, uh, for, for digital identity which involve uh, different uh, experts from uh, member states, representative. Uh, I mean, as part of this uh, important work stream, which is uh, the, main, uh, the main work stream for the Commission, uh, there are people who are pro, pro self sovereign identity type of a solution based on blockchain, and there are also many other representative member states who, which, who have a more conservative uh, approach for, for it. So, in the context of EPC now, we try to advance on the context of a self-sovereign sovereign identity, but more regarding the exchange of verifiable credentials, where we put in a very user-centric way, but we do not want to uh, compete or to create confusion with our, the work of our colleagues. What we aim to do and what we are doing is that we liaise um, directly, but also with the support of some uh, members in a, from a, from a, from experts from member states about how this this new EU DI wallet could also enable or leverage on this concept of self sovereign identity and possibly an implementation on a blockchain but we are not yet here we are not yet here so that that's a, a topic which is difficult to uh, to discuss because i cannot uh, let's say uh, take uh, in too much initiative because the official line of the commission now is what concerns this regulation on uh, on uh, digital identity that's it but now i have really to to, to disappear uh, many thanks for your interest and uh, and uh, i i let you in good hand with uh, with sarah and uh, and zoren and probably we can liaise about the outcome of this uh, event so many thanks for uh, for having uh, invited me and uh, and see you soon uh, zoren uh, and um, good uh, good event to everybody eh? bye 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 thank you pierre thank you bye. so much thank you also for the excellent questions because the community practice main purpose is really the information exchange and the knowledge sharing. So we want to have this as interactive as possible. So now I'd like to pass on the floor to Mariana.
de la Roche. Uh, great to have you. You are the lead manager I hear from. I see here from IOTA Foundation, but also the co the chair, the co working co chair. I'm sorry of the working group for social impact of INATPA, which uh, Pierre also just mentioned in his presentation. So Mariana, please, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, can you hear me now? So good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, I was really excited by like on the presentation that Pierre was doing because I could relate and I knew most of the projects that he was referring. So it is good that uh, he was first and I just like can deep down in some of the topics that he discussed. I had some technical issues, so I'm not in control of my presentation. So Sarah, if you can share maybe the screen and then I will just let you know when when to to pass um, to the next one. Um, so yeah, uh, you already heard my intro, so I don't need to refer to who I am. Um, so if you can give me the next slide. Um, okay, so I'm pretty sure that we will hear a lot about like um, climate applications in regards to mitigation. So I wanted to actually like start like by saying that when we talk about uh, blockchain for climate adaptation, like climate applications, we are not only referring to mitigation, but we also refer to adaptation. And we not only talk about like carbon credits, so I was really happy that um, Pierre referred to some of the other use cases because there is like different industries that can be uh, pushed forward with blockchain uh, for climate adaptation such as the automotive industry, supply chain, you already uh, heard about the digital product platform. I'm going to give a couple of examples about that as well. Um, the mining industry, which is also a cooperation with the AC that I'm going to refer, and then the energy sector, which for me is one of the priority topics right now, um, not only for the any use of blockchain, but also for the crisis in which we are in Europe right now. Next slide, please. Um, I will also like to just like give a brief intro so those that have never heard about blockchain understand why blockchain is important or has a role for for climate action the first thing i wanted to refer is like to the last comment that pierre did about like uh circular economies uh circular economies doesn't mean uh sustainable solutions per se uh circularity is just uh, more about like how we can keep products on the market as long as possible while sustainability is more broader conception of the environment people uh, and the planet so to actually like have like more like circular economy solutions that are indeed sustainable we need data and in this like blockchain is a really big help so blockchain solutions basically enhance the transparency, accuracy, and efficiency and trust uh, of the data that we are using uh, in digital solutions. And this can be for the collection, the calculation, the report, the, the reporting part, or the assurance of the data. So mostly solutions using DLT represent a shift from manual collection and assessments of the data to automatic solutions that validate the data sets uh, and generate trust, what also can just like draft more investment into the sector and avoid the greenwashing, for example. So today, um, next slide. Uh, so today I would just like, like to give you a couple of examples. I, I pick like four examples in different sectors. So digital, um, I'm going to refer to that, but like long story short, like it's a project uh, we, we we had with the with the EC uh, for the mining industry. Signa and POS are two community members of the IOTA ecosystem, and then SUSE is a project that we implemented also with IOTA. And because I heard about the great news that Matthew had a baby yesterday. Um, and he couldn't join us today. I added a um, last minute project that I would like to present that is the project that Matthew was going to present that is the DMRB, which I will refer to at the end. So let's start with the project. So sorry if you give me the, the next slide. Um, I'm going to start with Digit. So Digit is basically a project that we have funded by the European Commission, which, in, which intends to create digital twins in different um, mines in European countries. And the idea is to monitor the raw material production, but also the mine's environmental impact. So the idea is to improve the efficiency and sustainability of mining operations in an immutable and transparent way with the blockchain. Uh, we don't think that can be later on be replicable in different regions because it's open source. Moreover, um, Digit brings like a really cool um, uh, it helps the device operators working on the mine to alert about alterations in the health due to exhaustion so they can take pauses and have 
like uh, healthy working habits, so they don't have any uh, health issues while working on the on the on the on the on the mind. And due to blockchain, these alerts about their 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 health are only reported to the person involved. So the privacy part here, especially because is a delicate data as like heartbeats. Um, is really important that, um, or like, it's, it would be impossible to do, or not impossible, but really difficult but without the blockchain. The next slide to refer it is uh, working on agriculture. Um, Sada, if you give me next slide, it will be great. Uh, and basically, uh, Signar is a really active community member in, in the IOTA ecosystem. And they they have like different use cases, but I'm going to refer today to the agriculture one because agriculture is also one of the industries that can be uh, better improved in 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 uh, by by the blockchain sector. Give me one second. Sorry, I'm just like trying to uh, close the the door so we don't have. Um, so basically what they are doing is that they are collecting data from crops via IoT devices as well. And so they can monitor the real time growing conditions and in and the, the real time growing conditions and the quality of the crops. And this information is reported directly to the blockchain. So we can see the trustability of the data. So we are certain that this data is collected from the devices that are connected to the crops. And once the data is collected, it is passed to an AI uh, system that reports back on the quality and the grow conditions. Uh, and finally, this is represented in a digital twin. So both projects that I just referred are using digital twins, which for me is like a really great uh, way to make easier for people to consume and understand the data. Um, next slide, please. Uh, then the two projects that I'm going to refer now, I mentioned is PROS and SUSE. Uh, SUSE is implemented directly by the IOT Foundation and PROS is a community member, an ecosystem community member, and both of them are working on the energy sector. So again, I wanted to refer a little bit more uh, because of the priority we have right now or like the crisis we have right now in Europe. So SUSE is the short for Secure Sensors Plat Platform for Smart Energy Networks. And it's a research project that we had implemented with the IOTA Foundation, uh, German companies and research facilities, as well as network operators. And the project goal is the conceptualization of a scalable and affordable solutions for reliable and secure data transmissions um, processing in sensors network, in particular in smart meeting applications. So, this project is trying to address some of the challenges that are faced by energy suppliers, uh, especially when they are trying to shape the energy transition towards a reliable and secure climate friendly uh, energy supply, while also staying uh, into affordable prices for the public. So to tackle a lot of these challenges, the partners in SUSE um, are working on a technical solution that provides a secure, scalable foundation uh, for the infrastructure applications um, to a state of the art communications technology. So basically uh, using the blockchain for sharing information and reporting on the energy sensors. Um, my next example will also stay in the energy sector, se sector as well as the sensors network and its POS, which is another community project um, in the IOT ecosystem. So basically, they have a solution that facilitates energy transition. In easier, not so easy words, what they're creating is a modular sensor system uh, from the recording, the recording, the transfer, and the evaluation of met of metal readings in many parts of the complex supply chain, uh, supply infrastructure of the cities. So basically, with their solution, they provide the infrastructure to collect, encrypt, and transmit information from sensors modules to perform an easy remote reading of individual meters. Um, units and evaluate the, the information. So these kind of applications such as SUSE and PROS are really, really useful when trying to assess or like make decisions about more energy efficient solutions, which have even more relevance nowadays to, to the to the current context. Um, I would like to finalize with the next example that I, I mentioned um, about uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification, which was the project that Matthew was intended to present today. Um, and this project is actually working directly with uh, GHG emissions. Um, 
and is uh, funded by the Canadian government. And um, basically what they are doing is working in climate monitoring uh, to guarantee the veracity of the data utilized by climate researchers and institutions relying on data that cannot be faked and therefore is data that they can trust. And this is basically because of the, the way in which the blockchain infrastructure is, setting, is set in, the, in this project. So the DMRB is answering to the need of, for improvement interoperability of MRB. Um, for those that doesn't know, MRB is like monitor report and verification. So this project is actually working in the interoperability of the MRB systems and activities to avoid um, double hunting, double claiming, as well as support uh, as to support like climate change strategies to become more cost effective and efficient in achieving their goals. Uh, so basically, the DMRB um, uh, like use like this the, these four things. So the first one is the standardized methods and protocols, for example, using smart contracts to automate requirements in digital MRB solutions. Uh, the second one is that they make use of an online plat a platform and knowledge hub to engage more stakeholders to develop and harmonize MRB standards uh, in an open and transparent way, of course. Uh, the third one is a combination of digital technology, te technologies such as um, the IoT devices, or digital sensors, DLT, and AI to, uh, to automate the um, the MRB, the digital MRB standards for climate action. So for example, switching from household service for energy solutions to IoT sensors. Uh, and the fourth is uh, generating data marketplace to connect and support data owners and data providers and, and users. So solutions using blockchain such as the DMRB project represent achieved from manual collection and assessment of the data to automated solutions providing validated data sets that generate trust, as I mentioned before, and can drive for investment uh, into the sector as well as avoiding uh, greenwashing, especially at the reporting part. Um, and when I mean digitalizing is because we not only use the blockchain infrastructure, but we are also using IoT devices. Uh, in the case of this project, the DMRB, um, are devices connected to certain machines in factories in, in Chile, where the project is, 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 is being deployed. And these sensors report directly to the blockchain, which is then connected to a platform where the information about the GHG emissions of the factory and their particular um, uh, machines are presented. They also use digital things to to, to showcase this. Um, and I think that this kind of project is really cool because before uh, this kind of infrastructure, we relied in collected uh, information that was collected manually from humans. And as humans, we are always subject to human mistakes. And these can impact and alter the data that we are using to actually make conscious decisions about the climate applications that we were going to to take. So if the data was wrong, the the, the probability of like having um, actions that were not going to be successful was quite high. So now due to the this digitalization of the data, we actually like have more trustworthy data and information that can help us to assess better the situation on the field and therefore make better decisions. Um, if you have more questions about the MRB, I suggest you to contact Tom Bauman and Matthew Jagger because they are the experts on, on this use case, which is really, really great and has multiple uh, use um, uh, pilots already and they are scaling. Um, so to finalize, and this might be the last thing that I will say is that like, I really believe that there is a huge potential on these technologies to help us to do the transition to a more sustainable industries and therefore giving us a better chance to address climate change. And I, I always say this in all my presentation is that technology is just a tool and it comes to us in which direction we will move forward. If it's, if it's for good or for bad, it really depends on human decisions that we take with the technology. But I hope that these examples like provide some lights about the direction in which we should all move forward. And I just remembered that Pierre mentioned in ADPA, I was not planning to refer, but we have been also like working a lot uh, on sustainability and, and climate actions. Uh, I, as I'm, as, it was mentioned before i lead the the work i could lead the working group uh and we reported uh, we, we reported we presented our report this year about climate adaptation applications because most of the focus has been in mitigation but there are also some some use cases nowadays that are helping with adaptation which is like how we cope with the consequences of climate change at this moment if you want more information just feel free to reach out to me i'm happy to share the report and everything that we have done thank you well, Mariana, thank you so much for this really inspiring uh, presentation. So, but I want to take the opportunity to ask some questions, please. And if not, I will ask one myself, but please uh, first, any participant, if you have um, some questions, yeah. Uh, over to Dirk Osiak. Osiak. 
Yeah, thank you, Rowan. Um, yes, I have one question. Um, you said that uh, DLT offers more efficient and better data. And um, yeah, that's my question. I don't really understand that. Let's take um, Signal or Digit, for example. Why is uh, DLT a better solution than sending the data via end to end encryption? Um, because, in my understanding, after all, the problem is almost always not that the data is changed during or after the transmission, but that the wrong data is entered from the start. So, and I understand that DLT offers a solution where you cannot change the data once it's in the system, but, but I don't think that's a problem we have. Um, I don't think that there is a perfect solution and I will not like try to sell like blockchain as such and that will replace all the other technologies. So I think that there is like a, it needs to be a cooperation also between like different technologies and like the IoT sensors that we are using, of course. I highly disagree that the data is not manipulated after it's collected uh, because those cases are still happening and that's where actually the data is mostly manipulated. Of course, if the sensor is alterated, the data that is reported into the blockchain is going to be alterated, but that is easier uh, to just like actually check if you have a review on the sensors or you have a third party doing the verification of how the sensors are, are set in. What it is true is that once uh, the data is uh, uploaded into the blockchain, like any kind of manipulation, we will be uh, immediately ident it will be easy to identify, and that's where the trustability of the data and the actually the trust on the data comes. If the sensor has been alterated, like that is not like the fall of the blockchain. As I said, like this is just a tool, uh, and it depends of uh, how we are using it. Uh, what I can tell you, like in we have third parties uh, that are involved in the pilots that we are deploying. So the sensors are being not only deployed by one party, but like are like verified by other parties to actually guarantee that they have not been alterated. Thank you. So then I would like to pass the floor to Alexandre from the UNF C. So thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my, so my name is Alex Perez. I'm with the UNF C Secretariat uh, with the Innovation Hub team. Um, Mariana, my, my question to you is, I really appreciate to, to, to learn about the different uh, projects within the IOTA ecosystem. I was already familiar with the DMRV, very exciting things that are coming from there. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, my, my question is if within the IOTA ecosystem, are you familiar with uh, applications for surveys and, and sampling? So we, we are looking, uh, trying to figure out who is working in that area and, and to digitalize and perhaps using blockchain or DLT uh, for surveys and sampling. I am not, but I can actually as a team, we have a really active community and they are like developing, like like I learn about projects like every day. So I'm sure that one of them already taught in one of these solutions. So if you want, I think, I don't know, like uh, Sara or, or Soren, you can just like change uh, our contacts and I can just like do some research, research for you and put you directly in contact with the community member that is, that is doing uh, these use cases for you to explore. Thank you. Yes, sure. happy to happy to connect you. That's also Thank the you. idea of this community of practice. So um, there are more questions. If not, like I actually had one for you, Marian. <laughs> you said it's not about technology, as we hear, of course, a lot. But um, so what for you were, or for instance, this project in Chile? What do you think um, are the biggest areas or challenges you face implementing those those problems? Yeah, well, there are multiple. Um, I will guess that um, like in general, it's a matter of education. I think that there is still a lot of uh, prevention when you discuss blockchain projects and most of them call for misconceptions. So when you talk about like the energy consumption, for example, everyone has in their mind uh, the Bitcoin energy consumption and not all protocols are the same, uh, especially like we have seen the willingness of the sector, especially with the with the Ethereum merge in like going into more sustainable options. But like that's one case, you know, like we use DAC and DAC has always been more sustainable 
sustainable. There are also like protocols that are using blockchain and proof of statement that are even more um, energy efficient than Ethereum because there is a lot of like variables, um, such as like the hardware that you need to to, to use to to, to deploy the, the the nodes. Uh, so there is like a lot of considerations there. Um, so I do think that there is coming from a, a place of um, lack of understanding and knowledge of the technology uh, and only what like some media put out there and all the noise that is happening, which is mostly not true or partially true. So I think that we need to educate more um, people outside the bubble. So I always say that we need to break the blockchain bubble because we cannot keep just talking to each other and pretending that these solutions are going to just like be incorporated into NGOs or the job of like the UN just because. Um, so we actually need to educate why blockchain is important in which case it is important. Like blockchain is not a database. So if you need a database, you shouldn't deploy a blockchain project. <laughs> so all of these kind of considerations um, are really important for us to expand because at the end we have like really cool use cases, but they are not going to put us where we need to be for like, for example, the agenda 2030, if they are just deployed in pilot. So we need like uh, scale those projects to achieve like a uh, global impact. And the only way to do that is just like cooperating with people outside of the blockchain space. That will be one for like the general thing. If we are talking about the VMRB, I think that it comes also to education, uh, but like also at the local level because when you deploy these projects uh, you need technical people on the field that can do the implementation so this project was really interesting because it was funded by the Canadian government Matthew who is the technical lead and who has been driving this with Tom Bauman and both in, in the United States and in Canada the technical team that I was that, that was working with me at the time and the project management team at the time we were all in Europe both in Poland and in Germany and the pilot was in Chile so this was a really international cooperation I was really excited um, we had like this like language barrier so we were like changing from Spanish to English all the time so it was really really cool thank god I speak Spanish because I'm Colombian uh, which facilitated the process but we noticed that like if you want to actually like showcase a pilot and create a pilot and actually like be successful in it you also need to do a work with the people on the field deploying the project so they understand what they need to do how how we can support and how they can support us so this process was really beautiful because we also did that with the team in the field in Chile and that's what it made the project so successful um, and, and as such we actually scaled it and we have like the MRP.2 uh, and Matthew now is scaling to different regions and areas based on the outcomes of these two pilots. Okay well thanks so much again great <laughs> also the last part you shared with us uh, some more your personal views there but now let me please uh, move on to Nick, Nick Beg Beglinger uh, the CEO of the Clean Tech uh, 21 Foundation so it's a great pleasure to have you and the floor is yours. Please, Nick, go, go ahead. We do see your screen at the moment. Thank you very much, Søren. Yeah, I hope you do. Let me get that in full screen. So, so thanks for having me. I um, I'd like to dive right into it, uh, maybe with the exception of a very quick intro to show you that I'm on this topic of climate for quite a long time, as well as on the topic of technology in relation to climate for a while. I run the Clean Tech 21 Foundation, which is just 15 years old. Um, as of 2017, we are focusing on a few international projects after having focused on Switzerland first. Um, on the international and on the Swiss side, you'll see I underlined a word a couple of times and that, that word is policy. So when we are looking for leverage in order to find climate solutions, our um, basic conclusion is that we do need a lot of technology, but we also need a lot of policy and what comes with it um, in order to really advance fast. Um, CPX is a project that links companies with policy opportunities on a national level. Uh, the International Climate Incentive is a, is, a, is a project that looks at a very specific policy on how to price uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And Hack for Climate was the first ever hackathon linked to, to a, a climate conference where we tried to physically and practically link uh, climate and technology. We started that in 2017. And just to make the link um, concerning this event, uh, Alex uh, from the UNFCCC, as well as Dominic Schino from IOTA, they were both um, judges on this hackathon, so they know us um, well from there on. 
Um, when we speak about you know anything for climate action, I think it's really really important to understand what we're really talking about um, when it comes to climate. Um, and unfortunately, this is not a scenario where we can say, for example, like we can on the digital ID front that we discussed before in relation to the EU. It's not a topic that we can, you know, take our time to innovate and see where we are in 5, 10, 15 years. The reason is that we're so far down the rabbit hole that the solutions that we need are, need to be disruptive and they need to be really, really disruptive because we have at the current rate about eight years left to reach the climate targets that we should before entering into catastrophic fears. And that's, um, I think, really important to note because we don't just have to innovate. Uh, we have to innovate in very, very specific areas where we really can make a difference, a difference that is meaningful in order to, to achieve the actual uh, climate targets um, about all the, where this is all about. Um, this is sort of on the left side, you see a slide where this is symbolized by the IPCC, just what type of path we have to go through. So all the way up is where we are now and the very, very steep way down is where we have to be in maybe 20, 25 years. On the right, you see the latest research by IMF. This is not just now about um, you know, emission data and, and counting molecules in the air, this is now diehard economics. If we're too late, it's going to get really, really expensive. So we have all types of reasons uh, why this has to go extremely fast. I'll give you just one example um, that, you know, this is really real. And also um, uh, where technology already comes in, you have this, this, this uh, August uh, of this year, where on the one side of the planet um, in Pakistan, a third of the country is underwater because there's rain so much. Um, on the other side of the planet in China, it was so dry that actually technology was in, um, deployed to try and make it wetter. An airplane or a drone was put up in the air to distribute um, silver iodide uh, to make it rain, a really dangerous type of uh, technology. So um, this is an example where basically out of, out of desperation, the Chinese government has entered the, this fear of deploying this type of dangerous technology. And it also shows you how real our problem really is and how, how real, how urgent um, what we have to do uh, is really uh, upon us. Now, when we think about the disruption that we have to achieve, I think uh, my main case here is that, yeah, we have to look beyond technology and it has to start all the way at the very top, at the global governance level. We are just coming out of COP27, where actually the focus was on implementation together, but actually the result shows that we're not implementing at all and we're not together either. Um, to, the all, to the extent that today there are many people, here you have an example of the Financial Times citing a couple of important people, um, that, that actually tell us we have to fundamentally innovate and disrupt the current global governance process. So it goes a lot beyond technology. It goes all the way to how the COPs are organized, what shall be discussed at the COPs, what can be discussed at the COPs. Because if you look at the chart on the left, you'll see we'll ha we have passed a number of COPs, 27 COPs. Um, only two of them have mentioned the word fossil fuels in the text. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot more that has to happen. Now, in our options as to what has to happen, as I said, global governance is one. There was a lot of emphasis on lifestyle and ESG type topics where we try to engage with voluntary measures to, to achieve things. And we haven't really uh, reached that much. Emissions are still going up. So here comes technology. And I think technology can play a very important role, but not just in the context of technology and, and policy. We have to think beyond just technology. We have to also think into, into business models and processes, because as uh, was explained by IOTA, it's not just one technology that's relevant. It's usually a whole series of technologies that then make a process um, that, that is really relevant and that can lead to disruption. So we have to think at the right uh, level and then come back all the way to something like uh, uh, national climate policy um, to basically make the, the full swing. But if we focus now on tech, I think we can look at um, and we try to achieve exponential type effects. I think we can 
separate three main drivers, and that's of course emission free. So it's about climate. This discussion, and and yes, our 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 one of our main macroeconomic drivers will have to be uh, emission free. And then there is digital, and then there is decentral. Uh, we believe um, that a lot of the disruption going forward for climate and beyond is going to be a, a mixture of these three macro drivers. So yes, there is room for uh, technology and there is room for distributed ledger type technology because in fact, yes, a lot of um, uh, uh, there's there's trends from central to, to decentral. But when we think about where to apply to this technology, where to apply our innovation, I think it's really, really important that we that we that we that we focus on those areas that are really worthwhile. And of course, you know there are many, many examples. But I have two charts on the right that um, should give you two um, examples of maybe how not to do it. And so a lot of the current um, uh, blockchain and related projects focus, for example, on emission trading systems. Um, the EU has a strong focus on emission trading systems. A lot of innovation programs are focusing on emission trading systems. If you look at the OECD's data, uh, you compare what actually is our emission trading systems doing today vis-a-vis -vis another way of pricing emissions, and that's a carbon tax. You actually see the figures 89%, 11% were, were true for 2008. We're, we're waiting for the new figures now. Um, but the point is, if we innovate on pricing emissions, we shouldn't innovate predominantly on emission trading systems because emission trading systems, at least until now, have a, a, a small effect on the overall emission pricing. Actually, almost 90% of the current effect is happening through tax and not through trading systems. So if we innovate, let's not innovate predominantly on emission trading systems, but maybe let's innovate on tax. Another example is carbon markets. Um, a lot of focus is also on carbon markets. Just at the recent COP, there's been a, a zillion side events on carbon markets. And there you have a, a, a mandatory one, the compliance market, and the voluntary one. Most of the innovation tends to focus on the voluntary carbon markets. But if you look at the figures, the voluntary carbon markets in 2021 make about 2 billion US dollars, where the compliance markets were al almost at 900 billion. So again, should the focus be on voluntary on compliance, I would say it should be on compliance and, and to make sure that we actually innovate where there is where, where the beef is really low, is, is really at. Um, given, given that and, and adding some macro considerations, I think if you look at technology, never look at a singular technology, but think about a technology as, as having tools, code, things like that, but also processes. There's there's no area where this becomes more obvious than this MRV that has been mentioned by Mariana and others, um, where you know you can have a great technology, but if the policy behind it or the standards behind it um, are not um, in line with the goals of, of innovating fast, then you don't move um, uh, fast enough, and you maybe don't even have a real scope for for meaningful innovation. So. It's, it's technology as a blockchain, but it's a, it's a lot more around it. And oftentimes we're back at standards and regulations and things like that. Then if we look at the macro drivers and think about digital, there again, um, I think the question that Dirk asked, asked before is really relevant. You know, where in, in this innovation landscape is it really so important that information is, is, is dealt with in a distributed and decentral uh, um, way, uh, what what really makes the difference of having it distributed and not central? Yes, digital, but does it really have to be distributed? There's been some great digital innovations that are very centralized. If you think about Airbnb or Uber or these things, they're very digital. They use decentralized infrastructure, but the data structure is totally centralized. They made a lot of progress. They serve a big market today. So it doesn't, no, it does not necessarily need to be this decentral when it comes to data all the time. Um, we have to be critical about, about you know, just saying, yeah, decentral is great, immutable is great. Immutability is a lot more than, than central versus, versus decentral. So, so that point, I think, is quite important. Um, and the decentral concept per se, it's always really significant to remember there is a component of infrastructure that can be decentral, 
that there, there's a component of data that may or not may uh, may or, or may not be decentral. Uh, so there's a big difference uh, there. And the side note, as the last point on this slide, is that if you think if we think about these issues, um, especially in the concept of blockchain and not just the Bitcoin blockchain, but but these problem sets are very different from the pro problem set of having you know a, a decentral uh, currency. Um, there, a central agent can can print more money and cause inflation, and there is real need and, and and good logic why a decentral system can make a lot of sense. In in climate, the 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 the, the, the landscape is completely different, and we cannot automatically as assume that everything strictly decentral is always the right way forward. Now. Let's leave aside all the policy issues that I've ish, uh, that I talked about before and focus in a little bit more on, on technology. And here, I, I suggest that uh, people take a look at uh, what the VEF calls the fourth industrial revolution. We like this concept from the beginning, um, and and trying to sort of group a little bit a number of technologies where maybe very disruptive innovation could come from. And the VEF offers a great basis for this. Uh, you can you can see these type of uh, visualizations and 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 uh, data structures to further information, as I have on the left of the slide. You can find that publicly on the web. If if you scan that for sustainability relevant stuff, and if you think about sort of the problem sets that we usually see in 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 climate and 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 climate relevant areas. We think it's particularly three things that, that, that could work together in, in an interesting way, and that's the Internet of Things, as was mentioned already many, many times, the distributed ledgers and the artificial intelligence. These three, three things together, over and above just blockchain, is maybe where uh, the, the, the most beef is uh, to be found on that bone. If we look at this a little more in detail, why is this an interesting combination, uh, this IoT, DLT and AI structure, as we call it, the disruptive troika? It seems like, you know, when we really want to innovate in, 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 in exponential disruptive ways, what we, what we need to do is, is create entirely new um, processes and systems for certain problems. And in that, it, with that approach, IoT is, is a great way to capture data, um, DLT may be a great way to administer it. Um, there's other ways to do it, but let's assume for a moment we administer, it, administer that data in a distributed way. And then AI is a great way to learn from the data that we have captured and administered, and then also to um, enable back the IoT with automated commands in order to create systems that can work by themselves that are actually, um, um, you know, dynamic trust and incentive systems that are not just a single step uh, innovation, but really create an entirely new uh, way of doing things that then get, gets into automated ways um, and, 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 and therefore, you know, quite, quite powerful ways to, to innovate. Now, if we try and you know leave the other areas aside and 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 to round off my input, uh, focus a little bit on the specific area of energy, which is to about 75, 80 percent uh, relevant. Uh, what our what our climate challenge is concerned, there we clearly can say there is a trend from central to decentral, and what what sometimes gets forgotten is that this is you know a great thing that we transit to to decentral, that it has multiple benefits of being decentral, first and foremost, if you think about the previous slide of the um, weather extremes, resilience of a decentral system, of decentral infrastructure, multiple PV panels are a lot safer if the hurricane comes than if you have a central coal or gas gas fired uh, plant. So um, here again, as a reminder, we have a tendency where we can say clearly energy shifts from central to decentral. Decentral first and foremost, however, not in the data structure, but in the infrastructure that, that runs energy. So PV panels, small wind, hydrons and stuff sort of as a side note in my view, but predominantly PV being very decentral. Um, decentral infrastructure, different small producers and not one big one. Um, at the Hack for Climate that I mentioned at the outset, a runner-up project uh, was looking at energy in 2017. 
and then managed to pull um, the first government funded project on blockchain and energy in Switzerland that, that did a pilot in this beautiful little town you see on the picture on the left, where it, where it tried to apply blockchain in an energy space where a local energy market was created. And then using a blockchain, that local energy was traded before there was an interaction with the public grid above. Um, and the objective of the project was to see how, how you know, renewable energy could be fostered by looking at local demand and supply first and foremost by sharing different decentralized um, uh, uh, production and storage infrastructure and then you know look at how this interacts with the public grid. So I have quite a lot of experience in this particular uh, field and sort of the sobering result of all of it is that the management of the data over the blockchain which was kind of at the heart of the project at the outset, turned out to be a very sort of, you know, uh, not so relevant area of innovation in this space. Um, on the contrary, there was two other areas that were, were, you know, identified as being really the key. And the one is uh, what you have in the, on the slide here. That's basically the, the smart meter um, as it's being deployed across the world today that sort of showed us um, a core problem of the, of, of, of the status quo. In the status quo, the smart meter is generally bought by the power company and installed at the consumer's uh, house or at the business premises. So the infrastructure is owned by the, by the uh, utility, but the data that is generated is actually the data by the consumer. And um, that, seems wrong in terms of information infrastructure because really that data helps the utility to charge the consumer the highest price so it optimizes top down from the from the point of view from the central utility utilizing the data of the decentral consumer and uh, the innovation that the project has brought forward is actually a prosumer or consumer smart decentralized smart meter where the ownership of the smart meter is actually with the consumer at the bottom, the data of the consumer enters that smart meter and it's the consumer who decides what data is shared um, onwards. So the, the, the logic of what a smart meter is, who should own it and how it should interact with the network really, really had to be switched on its head. And the same thing proved uh, to be the case when it comes to the overall grid management infrastructure and then also the grid regulation. Because in most grids or in almost all grids currently, uh, excluding pilot projects, the logic of running a grid is top down. You have a couple of big power plants, you have big distribution infrastructure and you make sure things balance out at that level and then you go network levels uh, downwards to try to make it work all the way to the actual place where the energy is, is, is used. And in a smart um, you know, climate and renewable energy proof uh, system, this should actually be the other way around. If we want fast deployment of photovoltaic panels on the roofs of private houses and businesses, we need to make sure this is financially worth the effort and therefore it needs to work out for the decentral infrastructure that these consumers own. So they have to be incentivized, therefore the network topology, the network logic of, 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 of charging rates and things like that has to be adapted accordingly. So instead of running a network top down, it should actually be run bottom up. And there you see the, the infrastructure, um, uh, physical infrastructure, transformers and things like that is not ready. And you also see the regulatory infrastructure is not ready. In many places, no matter what time of the day, the energy you sell to the grid is usually um, paid for at the not very attractive rate. The consumer is not uh, incentivized to uh, buy a battery and store some energy locally. So the utility complains that there is this this, these, these fluctuating amounts of renewable energies entering into the network, but actually the incentive structure to change that about um, is, 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 is not given. So therefore I'd like to conclude on the example of the energy that I just mentioned, but I think true for, 
for uh, literally every area that is relevant for, for climate innovation, that yes, we have you know, to deploy disruptive technology and this disruptive technology can absolutely also include uh, blockchain. But if you look at uh, the energy case, it's a lot of energy innovation in the form of panels and stuff that we can build on and must build on. There is a lot of digital innovation that, that, we, can, that we can deploy, but it's not just blockchain, it's AI and, and IoT, even more importantly at this stage in my view. And, and next to this, there is the regu regulatory part that has to be there. So it has to be worth generating distributed energy. Emissions need a price, for example, and you have to be able to share what you produce and store in, in the right way. So the energy regulation has to be adopted um, accordingly as well. So it needs to be bottom up and not top down, uh, as my example was going. So, so, so the, the, the plea to everybody on the call and maybe sort of the trigger for the discussion is that we really have to keep the integrated picture in mind. It shouldn't be, you know, we have blockchain, we like blockchain, let's look for a problem that we can solve with blockchain, but rather we have to see where are we in climate, what are the main drivers, what are our possibilities to kind of make it work and, and, and use this little remaining time that we have to reduce our emissions and then keep an open mind as to what um, technologies, what processes uh, and what regulatory changes that has to ha have to happen in order to get there. I'll make a stop at this stage and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nick, for this uh, great presentation and for this um, very holistic approach, right, of looking much beyond technology, we have an integrated approach, which is also policy driven. So, but now I really wanted to open up the floor. We have another around 10, 12 minutes for some discussion. So uh, what should be the major opportunities? So what are real opportunities of blockchain as we've just seen, but what are its shortcomings as well? And, uh, but the floor is yours. Please, uh, any questions you might have for the panelists. Not yet, so. Um, Basically, um, maybe let me ask you one question, Nick. <laughs> you, uh, is there some question? No, I wasn't sure. I just don't want to oversee anybody who wants to raise it. Oh yeah, here, Alex, please. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll break the ice with Nick as well. Uh, <laughs> so you've uh, mentioned some um, criticism that was all over the media around the cops. And you said the cops need to be reformed. Do you have uh, some thinking around future cops? How this 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 event that it should be run in the future? <laughs> yes, I absolutely do, Alex. I'm not as sure if Søren agrees on me expanding too much on it, but if Søren allows, I would say one minute. Yes, yeah. please go ahead. I mean, this is of course far beyond the seminar, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it has a little bit something Please to do with ahead. blockchain. Well, you know, Alex, I think it's it's very obvious today. This multilateral process where all countries have to agree on on the same terms on one night, uh, that's not going to work going forward. I think it's been obvious actually from the beginning that if you have countries such as Saudi Arabia who are basically, you know, oil producers first and foremost, you will not get to agree with those countries on the type of measures that we need to agree in order to make the progress that we need to make. And therefore, I think the pro COP process is going to develop from a multilateral into a plurilateral process. And I think that we have to have the borders on trade and sanctions to in order to enforce climate policy. Uh, the Paris Agreement was basically a voluntary agreement. Uh, uh, sort of everybody can contribute on an NDC level what they like to contribute and we try to somehow make it work in the total. But I think going forward, there will be climate clubs. The EU has made some progress there with their CBAM initiative. And I think that's, that's a main part that we have to make climate policy enforceable nationally and internationally. But I'm happy to discuss this with you over many beers 
and many nights because it is a very interesting topic and you're very qualified to, to discuss it with. <laughs> okay, great, wonderful. So, uh, oh, there is, oh, Annika, you have a question from Annika Lincoln GIZ, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sören, and also thank you so much for this uh, really excellent presentation. Um, I'd be curious about the role of um, how you see the role of IoT, of sensors, etc., because you've been at the end quite critical of uh, blockchain. But in the end, you know, also deploying all these technologies um, also creates additional, uh, yeah, a burden perhaps on the environment and um, how how you actually see this whole process in terms of we still want to to grow, we want to use these disruptive technologies, but how can we find the right balance and how can we actually know where we should deploy and where we should not deploy to have, yeah, to have good evidence on that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for this question. I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, the, the, the really, really important thing is not to have, you know, blockchain blockchain in the center and then go out with blockchain in, in, in your hand to look for, 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 for problems that you may be able to solve with it, but, but to look at problems that are um, uh, upon us and then, and then look for ways to solve these problems which may or may not include blockchain. I'm not so worried about energy consumption, frankly, because I think uh, energy consumption is is not our our, our, our biggest. Uh, like we can solve uh, renewable energies, and and if something uses energy, um, that's not per se a bad thing. It just depends on what type of energy it, it, it uses. So so yeah, the the Bitcoin blockchain that uses extreme amounts of energy is of course sort of a, a, on a different sphere. There, I think the main, there, the energy is a problem, but an equally important problem with the big point blockchain is that it's just far too slow a, a, in order to address most sort of relevant use cases. If you, if you try to monitor, you know, many, many different um, distributed renewable energy sites with IoT devices, you want these devices to, to input into a database very frequently. Uh, if, you mon if you monitor land use change with satellites, you know, there's lots of data that has to, has to be entered all the time. A Bitcoin blockchain is too slow and too energy intensive for that. My, my main point, I think, is um, and, and by the way, there, there's reached research around for many years already that in general, the use of data and, and, and data-driven technologies is bottom line a plus for the climate and not a negative. So although IT uses energy and, and can have a negative impact, it also brings about a lot of efficiencies of, you know, linking your heat pump with your solar panels and your batteries, things that have nothing to do with blockchain, but have a lot to do with information technology. So in general, it's okay to use some energy for IT um, because it usually generates efficiencies that, that are, are way more significant than the, than, than the, the energy that, that it uses. I remember research from Swisscom, at least five years old, that, that show that in quite a lot of detail and I'm sure you'll find lots of uh, data on the web uh, for for this as well. Uh, the key thing is that it's not a distributed database that first and foremost will, will, will bring us forward, but it's a, a suite of things that must fit together and create a new type of solution system um, that, that, that has much more potential to bring us forward and that has only potential to bring us forward if the regulatory infrastructure, the standards and, and, and things like that are also adapted. So the last thing we should do is, you know, organize hackathons on blockchain, but actually um, organize hackathons or on distributed energy and then have some blockchain guys, some IoT guys, some AI guys, some regulatory guys and come back and come with the right solutions, right? I can I that. can I jump in there one second? Because yeah. like yeah, like I, I just I love some of the points that Nick just did, and I just I wanted to to refer to that. Uh, I also talk about like the energy consumption. I can agree more with Nick. I, I think that there are like three things that we need to discuss when we are like, talking about like the energy consumption of blockchain. One is like which type of energy are we using? Because we use energy all the time that like, we are using right now to have this call, right? And that's not bad per se. 
but like which kind of energy are we using and what is the purpose of that energy? Are we just like using these applications to make the richers rich, <laughs> rich for richers, whatever? Or are we actually deploying solutions that will help us to just create financial inclusion? Are we deploying solutions that are going to help us to achieve the 2030 agenda? And the third thing is like, with what are we comparing when we talk about energy consumption? So I read a couple of weeks ago, a um, report from Sarsom Foundation, which actually like showcase the amount of energy that the traditional financial uh, market use and it's four times more than Bitcoin. So what are we comparing with when we say that there is a lot of like use of of energy there? So I think that this is like one of the great points where I think like all of this misinformation is coming from and we need to do a better work on actually like creating data to showcase this. IOTA Foundation has a beautiful report on like, I, I call it beautiful because I got super excited when I read it about like actually the energy consumption where we deploy nodes. And then the question before was an about IOT and then like Nick also makes a great point there and I refer to them and I think like, um, yeah, as well and it's like blockchain is the underlying infrastructure so there is no magic solution that you can just like copy and paste in different contexts and then just like think that this is going to solve like absolutely everything like you need to work with the context as in any other uh humanitarian or uh development <laughs> project but what is important to know is like blockchain alone won't create the impact so we need iot devices we need ai we need big data we need to actually like work with the communities to understand how we can implement these new technologies for them to use in the projects that they already have so they can do like be more efficient and and effective in, in what they are doing iot devices for me is like one of the best ways to collect information because you take away the human error from the equation which is a big thing uh or like progress for for me just those two comments thank you, thank you so much we have one last question for me it's uh julia please go ahead Thank you. Um, it was really interesting, um, but to uh, keep it uh, short, um, with you in Global South countries, um, where would you yeah, prioritize uh, ELT enabled or digitally en enabled solutions? Um, like um, as you said, where is it worthwhile <laughs> to use the solutions presented? Um, either yeah, um, um, carbon emission tracking, um, industrial in, in the industrial um, decentralized uh, solutions, do you have any recommendation? Um, well, I don't have a specific recommendation. I don't think it, it would be serious to just give a very general uh, recommendation like this. I think what the Global South is, is concerned, there two main points come to mind, or three. Uh, like the, the, the positive one is that I think in general, um, there's a lot of potential of doing good by by bringing technology to the global south because it allows um, people to access um, information that that previously was not accessible and it allows people to engage in transactions you know do small payments for an online learning course for example that that was not possible before so around the the, the global south the, the the money aspect of 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 DLT actually could be relevant. So you you, you know you, you can pay for things. Um, the if even if you don't have a bank account, um, the of course you know the mobile phone as a central device to interact with the world because there's no you know um, landlines and, and things like that. So so that's one. Um, the other thing um, I think uh, what's what's really important in the global south is that when we look at the problem sets there. We don't make the mistakes that we think, you know, we have to solve the problems like we did in the West, because obviously we haven't done so well in the in the West. Our emissions have been going up and and we have an unsustainable way of living. So in the global South, there's opportunities to what we call green frog. It comes from this word leapfrogging. We have to make a, a leap and, and jump over a certain technology stage that was was it, part of the normal development in the West, but does not have to be the same development um, in, in, in developing countries where, where you can go from one all the way to, to sort of the, 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 the ultimate, the, the newest, without uh, um, you know, skipping uh, a part of the middle uh, parts, if you know um, uh, what I mean. Um, and the last point I want to mention, I think is also quite relevant, and that maybe is also a little bit of criticism to some of the blockchain uh, folks around. I think it is scary for some of the um, um, governments, not just in the global south, but maybe a little bit more than, than in the West, 
um, of having these very decentralized systems where, where everything is really decentralized and they think that the control is completely lost. Um, so I think on, in some instances, it may be better to you know, collect really good data with an IoT device and then make sure that that data is verified in an automated way with AI. If that data is then collected in a central a database, that may not be that big of a problem. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sometimes a bit afraid that we scare people away by saying it has to all be distributed. Uh, the, the actual data um, a part can be centralized um, for many solutions. Uh, I think that the distributed nature um, of the database is overemphasized um, and, and may not be that critical to the overall solution. Okay, so with this somewhat provocative statement, <laughs> I think we're coming to an end uh, to mm. our fascinating uh, event today. Thank you everybody for participating. I see Mariana, you still had a question or wanted to make a comment? Because oh, no. yeah. Yeah, OK, no, because sorry. we are really out of time, but uh, to be continued. So this was uh, Sarah, maybe I pass the floor to you just to finish us off on the community of practice and stay tuned. Yes, thank you a lot, Sören, and I'll make it very quick because we, we are over time already. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll share my screen because we would be happy to, for your very quick feedback um, for letting us know what kind of topics would you like to see in future events, uh, what kind of formats. Uh, yeah, any feedback would be great for us, and we're looking forward to seeing you at one of the future events. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. See you Bye. soon. Thanks a lot.